I greet you in Jesus' precious name. Welcome to the farm. We're in the chapel today. We're right in the middle of winter. Outside, everything is white with a frost. It's a windy day, but it's nice and peaceful in God's house. I want to speak to you about a very important subject. And folks, I hope there's a lot of young people watching this program today. I want to speak to you about money. That's right, money. I want to speak to you about what the Word of God says about money. If we go to the book of James, chapter 1, from verse 9 through to verse 11. James says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Lowly brother, maybe the poor man. Okay? Verse 10. But the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. I want to say something right at the outset, just in case there's some people who have made a lot of money are watching this program and are busy getting offended. I've read the word of God to you. It's not money which is evil. It is the love of money which is evil. I want to just say that very clearly. There's no problem with money. Two men who were rich men. One was a member of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. That is the leadership of the nation. The other one was a rich man. The rich man's name was Joseph of Arimathea. And the man who was a member of the Sanhedrin was Nicodemus. Those are the two men that took the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, off the cross washed his body, put a hundred pounds of herbs around his body and embalmed him and put him in their own personal tomb, which would have cost a fortune to dig out of the rock. These were rich men. The disciples were nowhere to be seen. They'd run for their lives. So I want to make it very clear at the beginning of this program that the Lord Jesus Christ has no problem with riches. He has no problem with wealthy people. The problem he has is when money becomes God in your life. That's the problem. You see, the Lord is a jealous God, our God. He says it in the book of Exodus, my name is Jealous. He loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for your sins and my sins. And so he will not tolerate any other gods. If your God is the love of money, then at the end of this program, I'm going to pray that the Lord will take that away from you. Okay? Because anything that is more important than God in your life is an idol. So if you put in your trust in money and not in God, it's an idol. And you're going to come short. If you put in your trust in your health, and I'm talking as a senior citizen now, I'm telling you it won't last. I can see all the young people smiling and all the old people laughing because it's the truth. Okay? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Just look around and you'll see exactly what I mean. So I want to speak to you about the love of money, actually. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 6. And verses 10 and 11. Let's just go there quickly. If you've got your Bible with you. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 10 and 11. You see, this program is designed to tell the truth. And this program is designed for us to talk about things which actually affect you. Not froth and bubbles, not pie in the sky, but reality. And I'm speaking to young people who are starting off with families. Money is not a problem. It's chasing the money that is the problem because it keeps you from God. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 10 and 11. 
Here we have it. For the love of money, there we go, is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Verse 11 says, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. You see, when you become addicted to making money, you'll do anything to get that money. You'll bend the rules. That's right. See? You say, oh, no, it's just a little white lie. It doesn't matter. There's no such thing as a white lie. A lie is a lie. Thou shalt not tell lies. Okay? False witnesses. It's in the Bible. It's in the Ten Commandments. But we want that money. So we just, just, just change the law a little bit. You can't do that, folks. Because you know what happens? Then you let the devil in the back door. And then when you want to have a quiet time in the morning, you can't hear God because the devil's talking. He says, you're a hypocrite. God's not listening to you. See? And it upsets your relationship with God. God will always love you. That, nothing will change that. doesn't matter who you are. God will always love you because He is love. But it, it, it pollutes your relationship with Him. So we've got to walk in holiness, righteousness. Now sometimes, in order to do that, you have to forfeit some money. Because you say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. They say, if you don't do it this way, you have to pay the full price. Well, then I must pay the full price. I've done that many times with farming. And I felt like sometimes saying, Lord, I don't have to give that, 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 that particular amount of money to the maize board or the this board or the that board. I'll just sell it out the back door. And the Lord says, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Render unto Caesar what Caesar's. Render unto God what's God's. In fact, as I'm telling you that, it reminds me of a story many years ago. Many years ago, I was preaching in the Eastern Cape. And what they had done was my worst, by the way. They'd set up a panel. And they put four or five of us Christian farmers on the panel. And then they had all the farmers to come in. There was maybe a hundred farmers. And they were asking pertinent questions, you know. What does the Bible say about this? And it was at a very critical time in the political situation in our nation of South Africa. And I'll never forget one farmer, he said, I've got a question for Angus Buchan. So I thought, oh, here we go. I'm not very good at this kind of thing. <laughs> he says, is it right to pay taxes to a government that I don't agree with? Something like that. And straight away the whole place went quiet and then everybody turned around and looked at me and they probably thought, right, let's see what the young man can, how he can answer this one, you see. So what I said to him was, I said, you know, it's funny. They asked Jesus the same question. They asked Jesus whether it was right to pay taxes to Caesar because Caesar at that time was oppressing the Israeli nation. They were the conquerors that come in and taken over the country. Is it right to pay taxes to a government like that? And of course, if we go to Matthew chapter 22, and verse 20 and 21, let's go there, because I love the Word of God. Matthew, if you've got your Bible with you, the first book of the New Testament, and chapter 22, and let's see what the Lord did, because that's what I told those farmers. And you know, when I told them that, they had no more answers. It was finished. Game, set, and match. <laughs> That's what I love about the Word. If you quote the Word, nobody can argue with you. They can say, we don't believe it. You say, well, that's up to you. But that's what the Word says, and I believe the Word. So Matthew chapter 22, verses 20 and 21. Here we are. Let's see. 20 and 21. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? Remember Jesus asked for a coin? They gave him a coin. He said, whose image and inscription is on this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God 
the things that are of God. So I said to that same farmer who was challenging me, I said, okay, have you got a 10 rand note? And he said, yeah, could you just pass it to me, please? And I said, whose name's on that note? Now, the government of South Africa. I said, well, render unto Caesar what's Caesar's. And render unto God what's God's. That was the end of the discussion. I want to say to you folks that we live in the real world. You must pay your income tax. Why? Because the government says so? Because uh, the South African Revenue Service says so? No. Because God says so. You can't be a Christian when it suits you and then be a Christian when it, uh, and not be a Christian when it doesn't suit you. No. It's either all or nothing. Remember, Jesus even paid the temple tax and he didn't have to. He told Peter to go down to, the, go down to the lake and cast a rod in hooked the fish, took a coin out of the fish and paid the, the temple tax because Jesus obeyed the law. Because Jesus is the law. So I want to speak to you about that money. I want to say to you that um, it's, not, it's not money, but the love of money that is the root of all evil. J.C. Ryle, a great man of God, said, it is possible to love money without having it. And it is possible to have it without loving it. I'll read that again so the farmers can catch it. <laughs> it is possible to love money without having it. And it is possible to have it without loving it. I have some friends who help me a lot. One particular young man is an extremely wealthy man. And he brings his aeroplane here and he transports me around the country so that I can get back to my beloved wife the same night. Otherwise, I'm never at home. He never asks for a penny. I don't have to pay for the fuel. He won't accept it. And he takes me gladly. That is his work towards God, I believe. He never mentions money, folks. And it cost him a fortune because he has to fly his aeroplane from Johannesburg to this farm, and then from here to Cape Town, or to Namibia, or to Northwest, or wherever it might be. Never says a word. A young man. Okay? I've met other people who've got no money. Nothing. And every time I meet them, all they speak to me about is money. I'm saving this. I'm, I know one young man's already buying his retirement cottage, man. Folks, we need to understand one thing. We need money to live. But when money becomes a God in your life, it needs to go. I believe God blesses certain men with lots of money because money means nothing to them. And I believe God doesn't give other people any money because if He did, they would never think of Him. When I was a young believer, I was farming here actively, very young. I just started as a lay preacher preaching around the district, and a Methodist minister came to see me. A lovely man, honest man. He had an absolute passion for farming. And on a Sunday afternoon after we'd had the service, and we'd had a nice big Sunday lunch together as a family, I told him to jump into my pickup, and I'll take you for a little drive around our small farm. And as I was driving, he said, Angus, I just love this. He says, you know, I believe God has never given me a farm because he knows that if he had given me a farm, I would have forgotten him. So sad, but he was honest. You see, for me, I love farming. I'll always be a farmer. But farming for me is a means to an end. What is the end, Angus? The end is to see people saved. The end is to see the name of Jesus Christ proclaimed right throughout the nation. The end for me is to see South Africa recognized around the world as a Christian nation, from the president right down to the street sweeper. That is my passion. My passion is not farming. My passion is preaching the gospel. And that's, that's why we, we use money, and that's why we need money. A Roman philosopher said, money has never yet made anyone rich. <laughs> Isn't that true? Money has never ever yet made anyone rich. 
In fact, a lot of people who worship money, they are like slaves. They don't sleep. They don't eat well. They're on the internet all the time. They, they're looking at the, at the stock exchange by the hour, and their life is a mess. You need to be careful. Anything that's more important to you than Jesus Christ is an idol. Do you remember Rockefeller? Rockefeller, I think, just about owned the half of the United States of America. Rockefeller said, the poorest man that I know is the man who has nothing but money. Yes. The poorest man that I know is the man who has nothing but money. I've met some of them. And you go to their palatial home, like a palace. It's like a morgue. It's like it's full of dead things. Everything you want opens and closes. I mean, I've stayed in castles. Deadly. Excuse the pun. And I've also stayed in a grass hut in Central Africa where they gave me a basin of water to wash myself and a jam tin to drink my tea out of with a slice of bread. And I felt more love and I felt more happiness and fulfillment there than I did in the castle. So money is there for a purpose, that's all. You know, my brother was a golf professional and he told me there was an old gentleman used to come and visit him and he had a huge sports outlet, huge. And one day my brother went to visit him and because he got all his golf balls and all his bags and all the rest of it for his golf shop. And, he, and this old man walked him through this empire that he'd built up. And my brother said to him, hey, you've done so well. And the old man, you know, tears filled his eyes. He said, I've spent my whole life building up this empire. And it's cost me my health. I'm very sick. He said, and now I'm spending the money that I made to try and buy my health back. And it's not working. Folks, we need to be careful that money is there just as a tool. It's not God. Never was and never shall be. I listened to an old Scottish preacher preaching once. And he said, and this was many years ago, in the days when they used to mill the corn, mill the maize or the wheat with a big wheel, big stone wheel. And it was driven by a water wheel. There was a little stream flowing down outside and would turn this big water wheel, which would then turn this big stone. And they would feed the two stones, the corn, and it would grind the corn up and out would come meal out the other side. He was a miller. But his biggest thing in life was making money. That's all he wanted to do. He was a hard man. He worked his men as hard as he could. That mill never stopped. He said that mill must never stop. It must run day and night. I never ever want to hear that mill stop. And then the old man got old and people used to come to him and say, you know, one day you're going to die. And, you know, have you ever made preparation for, for when you go home to meet the Lord? No, no, I'm too busy. I'm too busy working. I'm too busy working. He got very sick, folks, so that he couldn't walk. He made them take his bed and put it next to the mill so that he could hear the big wheels turning, grinding out the mill. This Scottish preacher went up to him and he had to shout to him in his ear, Do you know that you are going to die? Do you know that your time on earth is finished? Don't you want to repent and accept Jesus? He said, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. The mill is making too much noise. That man died in that bed. And he went to hell. You say, how do you know, Angus? Because he never acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What a waste. Folks, how blind are those who don't want to see. I want to suggest to you today that we need to put money in its rightful place. And leave it there. He that serves God for money will serve the devil for better wages. 
Wow. That was a man by the name of Roger Lestrange. He that serves God for, for money, he that is a hireling, will serve the devil for even better wages. And one of those people went by the name of Judas Iscariot. You can read it yourself in Matthew 26, 14 and 15. He sold the master for 30 pieces of silver. If you've ever been to Israel, you'll understand. There's a place called the Potter's Field. 2,000 years ago, the high priest took that money. They said, it's blood money. We can't keep it. Judas Iscariot realized what he had done, but it was too late. And he threw the money back at the high priest. They took that money because he didn't want it. And he went out and hung himself for the love of money. And the high priest went and took that 30 pieces of silver. And he went and bought the potter's field. To this day in Jerusalem, in the old city, just outside the old city, there's a field, a plot. It's empty. 2,000 years later, it's built up all around with houses and buildings and, and flats. And that field is empty. No one builds anything on that field. It was paid for by blood, Jesus' blood. Folks, I want to pray for you. And if you might be a businessman, you might say, Angus, you know, my heart is to make money for the kingdom of God. Praise God. Angus, I want my family to have what I never had. Praise God. Angus, I'm, I've always had a passion to farm. I want to have my own farm. Praise God. I want to be a businessman that can really make an impact in the kingdom. Praise God. But not at all costs. Not at all costs. I want you to close your eyes with me and we're going to pray a very serious prayer. And if there's somebody getting offended at my message, please, you need to go to the Lord after this and find out from God why are you offended. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Let us pray. Father, I want to pray for my dear friend. I know there's people, Lord, who love you with a passion. And they started off and all they wanted to do was to serve you. And they wanted to use their intellect, their gifts, their talent, to make money, to furnish the kingdom of God. But they've never really got there yet, Lord. They're still too busy trying to establish themselves. How much is enough? How much is enough? The things in life which are worth happening, having are things that you cannot buy with money. Health, love, peace, and uh, everlasting life. I pray now in Jesus' name that you teach us all, me included, to make sure that Jesus Christ alone is first in our lives. And then all these other things can be added unto us. Amen. God bless you and goodbye.